All right, welcome to Replit's first uh, developer day. Uh, so we have a lot of people here in our uh, office. This is actually our new office. Our last office was uh, an apartment a few blocks down. So this is our first proper office in San Francisco. So thank you everyone who came here. Thank you everyone on the live stream. And um, I mean, we're excited to, uh, to share with you some really big updates. Uh, but first, um, you might have heard that this morning we announced that we raised uh, $97.4 million on a $1.16 billion valuation. We try to be very uh, concrete with the numbers, so we're gonna give you all the details. But um, today's is not about us, today's about developers. Uh, we really wanted to put the message out there that Replit is ready to build on, and we're excited to show you all the, like really uh, going all the way from the details about what makes the platform more reliable today, to a lot of the big kind of splashy features that we're gonna talk about. So uh, just to give you a bit of background on Replit for those who don't know or if you need a refresher, our mission is to empower a billion developers. So, um, you know, our view is that as the world is headed into a place where software is running more and more of our lives, uh, whether it's sort of the cloud revolution, the mobile revolution, now we're headed into this AI revolution, software is a huge part of everyone's lives. Whether it's education, it's uh, running your personal lives, it's your business, it's collaboration, everything we do is powered by software. And we think we just don't have enough developers in the world, and also, we think that there's a lot more software to make. And everyone would benefit from at least learning a little bit of programming and making software for their own uh, uh, use cases and for their companies and families and communities. So we think we're really at the start of something huge. Um, and, but today, we're trying to show you the power of Replit. So it's not only just a place to get started. It's not only a place to learn. It's also a place to build and scale. So uh, Replit is uh, at core an in-browser cloud-based collaborative IDE. You probably all know that. You can uh, run any language on Replit. We built a lot of abstractions to make all that easy. Um, you, can Replit, you can run Replit on any device. And we pride ourselves for being the fastest way to go from an idea to running an app. We actually want to approach zero seconds asymptotically. We think that there should be no distance between having an idea and having a running prototype. So um, today we announced that we have 22.5 million registered developers all over the world. <laughs> For us, that means that this is a huge responsibility. Replit is increasingly the place where developers come to build their dreams. And we take that very seriously. And uh, our number one goal has been for the past uh, you know, uh, a year or so is to make the platform more reliable and to make it a better place to build on. So those 20 million users or so have created 236 million projects. They have, at any given time, Replit is running one million containers. So these are people coding or their apps are running. And those apps are getting 25 billion hits. So not only are we serving our developers, but we're also serving their users. And their users love their apps, and we also take that very seriously. When we started really focusing on, on infrastructure and reliability, um, we actually had to rewrite a lot of our systems from the ground up. And today, we're really proud of the infrastructure that we've built, and we're excited to share a lot more about it as we go. So today, Replit's experience is very, very different. A year or two ago, uh, as many of you I know are users, when you're using the Replit IDE, you probably have seen a lot of the uh, crashes. So we used to call them vSODs after the popular Microsoft uh, crash. But uh, you know, people would get a vSOD like once every 10 minutes when they're coding on average, sometimes a lot more. Right now, they're practically non-existence. We almost eradicated all crashes from the IDE. We made uh, multiplayer on Replit uh, a lot more reliable. Uh, Replit is kind of from the ground up 
multiplayer. Every REPL is a multiplayer REPL. You can invite people, you can code with yourself in, in different tabs. You can see how everything is collaborative all the time. And that was a really tricky problem to get right. But right now, we're really proud of, about how reliable multiplayer is on Replit. And we've improved uptime by 50%. So, and, and this is just the start. I think, uh, I, think, I think this will also go to 99% pretty soon. Typically, you know, users outside the US had a pretty bad experience with Replit. Um, especially, we have a large uh, population of users outside the US, but especially in India. Perhaps uh, more than half of our users uh, are around the world. And if you're coding from India, you get like noticeable delay. Anything more than 100 milliseconds delay is very noticeable. So 250 milliseconds was a pretty bad uh, experience. So we fixed it. So we sharded our infrastructure. That was a huge project. We embarked on maybe two years ago and shipped uh, earlier this year. And, um, and now uh, we're able to spin up uh, infrastructure in clusters all over the world. We started with an India cluster. And now some users in India actually have a better experience than the US, which is what we want. But we're, 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 we're expanding to, to be available all over the world. We launched our uh, mobile app um, about six or seven months ago. It's uh, on its way to get a million installs which is kind of wild. Uh, everyone. <laughs> we, we push the envelope a lot. And, and, and uh, you know, when we say a billion developers, a lot of people don't like that. But when, when we publish the mobile app, it's, it's, it, we, we got a lot of passionate responses about who would want to code on their phone? Nobody would want to code on their phone. Well, it turns out there's a million people that have, have, have decided to code on their phone, and we think this is going to be one of our more uh, popular uh, surfaces. We also added silently added iPad support. So you can now install it on your iPad. And we're seeing a lot of professional programmers use it for work by coding in their iPads. And it's all using the same Replit infrastructure. We've innovated a lot of things in the UX. And also, a lot of the features that you're going to see today, you'll be able to manage them. And you'll be able to uh, use them on your phone. And we're seeing people do very interesting things where you know, they deploy apps on their desktop, but on the go, they update them and manage them and, and respond to user feedback. As, um, as Replit has been maturing, we're starting to see businesses and startups start entirely on Replit. So these startups have started and or launched uh, on Replit. And it, you know, in some cases, Replit is handling their entire business workload, which is something very exciting for us. Um, and now, you know, today we're going to announce some, some uh, features and upgrade to show that you can scale your business all the way from an idea to raising millions of dollars and having millions of users. Also, uh, late last year, we introduced bounties. Um, part of our vision for, for Replit is to be a place where you learn your, your, to write your first line of code, you earn your first dollar. In the same way that we want to reduce the distance between an idea and an app, we want to reduce the distance between learning the skill and earning your first dollar. And now we're seeing people learn how to code on Replit and within two weeks start to make money, which is kind of wild. It used to take four years to make a dollar uh, from programming because you had to go through computer science, you have to go uh, and get a job, and, and then maybe you'll make some money. A lot of times you do a lot of internships before you make any money. And now we're driving it down to days. And we have developers worldwide earning on, on Replit. One of the uh, coolest uh, um, ideas in computer science is the idea of bootstrapping. You, you might know it from uh, compilers. So if you build a compiler um, you, uh, in, in, uh, in, in a language, say, if you build a JavaScript compiler in C, now you have a JavaScript language. And then you rewrite the compiler in JavaScript. And now you have a bootstrapped compiler, meaning the, the language implements the compiler. So same thing could happen in programming environments. And we always wanted to reach the bootstrapping milestone, which is the thing is built in, in the thing itself, which is this very strange uh, loop concept. And, and today we're proud to announce that we're running Replit on Replit. And this is very important for us because you know, one of our core values at Replit is seek pain. 
uh, which is kind of a strange concept. It's, it's not some weird fetish, but it's uh, the, <laughs> we, think that, we think that pain, we think that pain is very important uh, to, to learn, right? And, and, and for us to be connected to our users, we need to feel the same uh, pain and joy from using Replit. Um, and so we pushed, uh, we pushed our, our, our platform to its limits to make sure it can run itself. And now we're spending a lot of time in Replit and our rate of improving the, the platform has, um, has gone exponential because, because of this. We'll talk more about this uh, later today. So what's next? Um, power. I think that's, that's the thing we want to focus on today is power. At, at the end uh, of, of the presentations today, we have a huge announcement. We have a technical breakthrough that we're announcing. So please stick around until the end. Um, but a, a lot of what today is about is, is about how to pack, how we're packing a lot more power into Replit to make it the best place to build. We're going to start with deployments. De deployments for a long time uh, have been a, a really crappy experience for developers. They sort of, you know, we've had these moments of improvements. Heroku was, Heroku was a big moment of kind of, you know, improving how you can deploy. But it sort of hasn't changed since then. Like, it feels like we could do a lot better. And because Rep, Replit is this fully vertically inter integrated platform where we provide everything from an editor to, uh, to hosting solutions, we think we have something uh, that can fix the problem. This is one of my favorite XKCDs. This is about setting up a Python environment. But this is like, this is, um, you know, multi multiply that by 10 when you're thinking about uh, deployments, right? Because not only you have to set up your local environments, but you also have to set up a remote environment and you have to set up a staging and, and deployment environment. And we really want to solve all of this. So today, we're announcing that you can deploy a project right from your REPL. So you write the code. Um, you're iterating on the code, you get the output in the IDE. Once you're ready, you just click release and you can deploy uh, your project and um, uh, you can do everything from, from the IDE. And we're gonna, we're gonna show you a demo about this in a second. Briefly on the infrastructure, you might have heard that we had this uh, big partnership with Google recently. One of the reasons that we uh, really cared about, uh, we really cared about doing this partnership is that you know we're um, we're not very happy with how like most companies are building these deployment services. A lot of the times, uh, the, it, it's it's really unreliable. It's also not secure. So a lot of the uh, cloud hosting solutions are based in containers that lives in VMs with other containers. It's not very secure. It's not very isolated. It doesn't give you good resource management uh, guarantees. And so with, with Google Cloud, uh, we were able to, uh, to actually deploy to VMs. Um, and so uh, every project on Replit has a Google Cloud uh, isolation. So every time you deploy something from Replit, we actually create an entirely new Google Cloud project. So you have a project isolation guaranteed by Google. Uh, and on top of that, we give you a VM um, uh, to, to make sure that, um, uh, that your project is, is fully secure. Uh, and that, that we're giving you uh, resource uh, guarantees. It's also language agnostic. Again, we're giving you a VM, we're giving you a uh, computer in the cloud, essentially. You can do whatever you want with it. You can run bots, you can, uh, don't crypto mine, but uh, other than that, uh, you can do whatever. Um, and, and that's the ethos we have at Replit, is that everything should be built on open platforms and no lock-in, and you should be able to bring any app into Replit. You should be able to bring any app out of Replit. Um, and I can't emphasize enough how important it is that this is built on standards. Um, and uh, on top of that, we're going to introduce all the ease of use that you're uh, already familiar with on, on Replit. So uh, we're going to have all these high-level abstractions. But at the end of the day, you can drop down into, into Linux and do whatever uh, you want with the machine. So we have our uh, lead uh, platform engineer, Luis Chavez, who's going to come up. And uh, we're going to demo uh, deployments. I'm Luis Chavez. I'm going to be presenting a uh, live deployment. I'm going to write it from scratch because we want to we want to showcase the power of Replit, how fast you can go from an idea to actually having users use it. So I could probably type it, but it's going to be way more fun if I ask Ghostwriter for help. So let's try that. 
dim key bindings do you care? <laughs> no, it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to ask Ghostwriter to help me start this thing. So uh, make me a Flask app that listens on 0000, zero, zero, zero that shows the name and the sprite of a random Pokemon using the Poke API. I'm doing a live demo, please do not disappoint. <laughs> Let's see what goes right uh, has for me. All right, it seems like it gave me a pretty uh, reasonable code. I'm going to just copy and paste it, see what happens. Copy the clipboard. I'm going to try to run it. I see some squiggles, but I, I'm going to trust Ghost Rider completely, blindly. Run. Let's see what happens. Oh no, there's an error. What, go, what went wrong? Um, I can probably debug it myself, but it's probably going to be more fun if I ask Ghost Rider for help. So, code are detected. This is our Clippy feature. Uh, okay, so it turns out that uh, it just missed importing random. So I'm going to add it. Import. A random stop run and oh so close so I didn't want to JSONify what I want to do is to display the Pokemon so I'm going to do something like this image source equals and there you go thank you very much Ghost Rider Stop, run. Da -da -da. Awesome. It worked. <laughs> All right, so what you're seeing right now is just the, the developer preview. This is not quite deployed. Uh, and if, if I leave my REPL, it'll shut down after some time, just because we want to save resources. But now that I know that it's running, I'm going to click it again just to make sure that it's running. It is indeed running. I'm going to click here on release. I'm going to deploy my project so that all of you can access it. So first of all, uh, we're going to ask you a few questions about how you want to uh, like give some resources to your, to your deployment, how you want to customize your deployment, so on and so forth. Here, you have a little drop down with some options about how much resources to give your, your deployment. The first three options are shared uh, uh, resources. So that means that you're only going to get a fraction of a CPU. These are mostly for cost conscious and or smaller projects. If, on the other hand, you're going to do a larger project or you're expecting a lot of traffic, you can give a dedicated uh, VM. This is a very important project, so I'm going to give it to BCD. <laughs> uh, purchase and deploy. Thank you, Scott, for sponsoring this deployment. <laughs> and just one, uh, a few more questions that, that we need to ask you. First of all, you can customize your, your domain name. We, we don't, uh, like, uh, the, you can choose whatever name you want that ends in dot drop the app because it's premium. This looks completely fine. You can also optionally customize the build and run command. Since this was created in Replit from a template, uh, this is already set up for you, so you don't need to worry about these things. Finally, we have environment variables. These are good for if you want to store some secrets or, any, or something, or something that customizes your deployment specifically. We don't need to do anything right now because we just saw it working. And finally, whether this is a web server, this is optimized for HTTP traffic, or if it's a background worker. That's more for like Discord or Telegram bots, uh, but this is not one of those cases. So I'm going to hit deploy. And that's all the work that I need to do. What it's doing right now, it is uh, making sure that your, your files are consistent, and then it'll start the process of uh, actually deploying it somewhere. There you go. So, Normally at this point in time, if you were building something locally, you would need to like, oh wait, I need to go figure out how Kubernetes works and probably Docker, how to write a Docker file, write, start writing the Docker file, figure out, oh wait, I need some dependencies. Which dependencies uh, is this using? This is using Flask, right? Oh yes, it's using Flask. Which version of Flask? You don't need to worry about any of that. We take care of it for you. Right now what it's, what's happening is that we are taking your rep and we're converting it to a Docker container on the fly without you having to do anything. This is just like, we, we try to make it as simple for, for users as possible. And it's also going to optimize your particular REPL for uh, hosting in a, on a VM. And as Amjad mentioned before, this is not going to be running in a, in, a, in a shared container with a lot of other people. This is going to be a, a VM just for you in your own GCP project with all the security that it entails. 
So this is going to take a few more, more minutes. All right, so do you like cows? <laughs> I'm into cows. All right, yeah. cows. <laughs> so there's this command called cowsy, which uh, displays an ASCII uh, art of a cow saying something. Pretty uh, obvious. Cow say hello. But I didn't install it. Oh, turns out that would suggest like, hey, I found this, uh, this command that you ha don't have installed in these two packages, neocowsy or cowsy. Eh, I guess I'll go with cowsy. I'm old school. And that's it. I didn't need to, to install anything or, or figure out like, oh, is it the, the cowsy neo package or just the cowsy package? That's cool. And also, if I go here, this is an implementation detail completely, but Replit is powered by Nix, the Nix pack, uh, package manager. So after just running that one command, it automatically added the cowsy dependency onto my Nix packages. So we didn't need to do anything. So this is a native dependency, right? This is not a Python dependency. So that you can imagine this being um, uh, sort of a C dependency or uh, some kind of like ML package that you can't install with Python. If you've used you know, Heroku or some of these other uh, services, you can't actually edit the native dependency. So we're, here we're adding a native dependency onto the Linux container. Yeah, pretty magical. Okay, so um, now what happens if I want to take this little cow and put it in, the, in the, my deployment? Let's cast a little Ghostwriter for help. Um, make me a Flask app that listens on 0000, that shows the output of running the cow say command with a random Pokemon name. Let's keep with the, with the theme. All right, it gives me something that looks pretty okay. I'm going to trust the machine once more. See what happens. All right, copy it. Mac, hey, I got it. All right, I'm going to restart the thing. Okay, it worked, great. Awesome. Um, awesome, but now I'm thinking that this, this little cow is, is a little bit too, um, I just, I just want to share this little cow with my friends. I don't want to, to be open to the, to the internet. So let's ask Ghost Rider for help. How can I add Rebel Auth to my site? Should be, uh, this is a very secure cow. Super secure. secure cow. Okay, you, you can use the pre-built login page. Cool, you can simply enable, enable login page and login with Rebel sidebar. So what's happening here is Ghost Rider is actually lo looking up documentation for you. So you just add it, ask, ask it, how can I you know, secure my site? Ghost Rider knows deeply the Replit ID, so it can like, help you navigate it. So it told Luis, go enable this feature. And now if you restart the app, you're gonna get uh, user auth. Uh -huh. we, have, we have user auth. This is user auth, this is uh, uh, built and maintained by Replit, so you don't really have to care about how you authorize users. Ta-da! Oh, yes, I was, I was demoing deployments. So I, I modified this REPL a lot. Previously, before we did deployments, we had a shared environment. The, whatever you were seeing right here on the development side, that's where, where your users were, were seeing. Now, with deployments, we snapshot your REPL at the moment you, you click deploy, and uh, whatever you do on your REPL doesn't affect the deploy side, which means that the deploy side is for production only. So if I click here, Ta-da, this is what, what uh, was showing before I started making all these changes. Yeah, it, it's important to note also that all our deployments are, are f fully reproducible. So all the package management systems we use on Replit uh, are uh, built for reproducibility. So we use Nix for the uh, Linux native package uh, management. We use uh, Python Poetry, which has a lock file. So every deployment you create is actually reproducible forever. And again, this is our focus on security and reliability and reproducibility. We want, if you put a program on Replit, it should run forever. Like, you know, hundreds of years from now, you should come back and see this uh, Pokemon um, app running. Um, and so, but now we can also do, deploy the Kause, and you can also toggle and revert uh, and do, do, do ever, and manage the deployments that way. Yeah, all right, that's it for the demo. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luis. So uh, this, is, this is just the start. Um, uh, so, so now we, we have dedicated VMs. But, but uh, you know, the, the thing about deployments is that you know, compute, there's like all these different levels of abstraction, right? Um, and there's all, 
there's a lot of ways to run computers, is what I'm saying. And uh, this, this, is use, uh, this is best for use cases where you care about uptime. For example, if you're building a Pokemon site, you really care about uptime. Uh, and and, and you, can, you can toggle the VM resources. You can um, go between small uh, computers and go all the way up to really large uh, VMs. But what we're adding soon, and very soon we're talking about uh, weeks, is on-demand uh, compute. So let's say if you have an app that only runs you know, every few seconds and only run for milliseconds, uh, your cost would be around zero. Uh, and so we're going to introduce on-demand, uh, you know, this is similar to um, you know, AWS Lambda. We're built on Google Cloud Run, if you're familiar with that. Uh, it's also based on VMs, very good security and everything, but it functions sort of like a container runtime. And so this is going to be usage-based billing, and there's going to be a way to deploy also for free, uh, at least small apps. And you can, also, you can automatically scale up or down. You can also geo-replicate your app in the same way that we're geo-replicating uh, our application, and you can scale horizontally. So really serious about this idea of like uh, infinite scale at Replit. Um, and obviously static, this is, uh, this is something important also be coming soon. All right, so next we're going to talk about the development experience. So we just, uh, Louise just showed us how to build and deploy an app on Replit. Um, but also, uh, Replit is about building uh, software. And the act of building software, you also need powerful machines. The, the base level free experience is good for quick scripts and things like that. But the moment you get into a lot more dependencies, the moment you want to run something that's compute heavy, the moment you have a lot of different language servers and compilers and all sorts of things like that, you start to need more resources for your development environment. So that's why we have now boosts for the workspace. So you can boost the workspace. Um, you can go all the way up to 16 CPUs and 16 gigabytes of RAM. So this will run practically any project in the world. Now, if you don't want to kind of manage that, and you can pay by, by day and pay um, and, and manage that on your own. But if you want sort of a universal boost that is good for uh, all sorts of applications, you can see where it's in Pro. Uh, if you subscribe to Pro, which is uh, $20 a month, you'll get, um, you'll get a universal boost. So you don't really have to worry about it most of the time. Uh, but every now and then, you have a project that's, too, that's very big, and you can sort of uh, manage that manually. One, one of the things that's really frustrating about, that was really frustrating about using Replit, I ran into it all the time, uh, we had a one gigabyte limit per REPL. Uh, and, and the reason we did that is because it, REPL sort of functions as a, as a distributed system. And in the early days of REPL, when we introduced multiplayer, we were running into a lot of data races. And so we introduced this file system called ButterFS that has sn snapshot capabilities. The problem is these snapshots are, get really big and it becomes very hard to, uh, uh, to extract uh, the snapshot. And, Everything sort of breaks once we get a, uh, more than one gigabyte. So we were stuck with this limit for a long time because we thought the trade-off made sense. We need uh, our application. We, we, the, the most important thing is to not lose user data. So we thought that was a good trade-off. But then as Replit got more powerful, that became the main limitation. So today we're announcing that we are lifting this limitation. So you're going to you're gonna be able to go up to 256 gigabytes per uh, project and more. So basically, internally, we call this project Infinity Drive because we want it to be completely elastic and to fit any use case, run any code base in the world. Um, and, um, and, and especially if you're starting to do AI, ML project on Replit, if you want to train machine learning models, we have a GPU offering coming soon, and you want to store your data in, a, in the REPL, you can do that. You can just put gigabytes of data in your REPL and it'll just work. We spent perhaps a year and a half building this project. Uh, it's, it's really on the cutting edge of, of, of uh, um, cloud systems and infrastructure. It's a network file system, block storage device. And um, actually, right now it's out for all users. And we're about to flip the switch to, to make everything expandable. But we're, we're doing about 4 million uh, RPS right now. So, so as people are coding on Replit, there's like 4 million requests to this file system. This, this file system is already operating on a massive scale. And we're planning for this to go to billions of RPS. So we think this, this is the kind of the file system that will run all of Replit. It has a lot of really interesting semantics about it. For example, it has copy and write semantics. Right now, forking a project on Replit is really slow. 
it'll be milliseconds in the future. So th there's a lot more there that we can, uh, we can do, but, but the start is that you don't have this limit, and that's very important. Uh, on top of that, we've done a lot, a lot of improvements. You can go and read about uh, that on our blog, but uh, here's a, like a sample uh, of them, and uh, we're gonna showcase some of them in, in later demos, uh, but we've been really busy on little big details. We think all these things add up uh, for the experience to be flawless end to end. So now uh, we have uh, Scott Kennedy, who manages uh, the workspace and uh, platform teams, who's gonna, who's gonna demo the new workspace. Amjad talked a lot about the power, the quality and reliability work we've done, but the place it really all comes together is when we're building Replit on Replit. It's kind of the dream we chase internally, and we're ever closer. So you can see I've got a pretty beefy REPL here. I've got 16 CPUs, 16 gigs of RAM, and 16 gigs of storage. Our node module dependencies alone is eight gigs, so we really count on Infinity Drive to do anything. I've also pulled up the README for our repo. This is how to get started. This is what we would typically show someone on their first day at Replit. Uh, it's kind of annoying. It's also embarrassing. It's, yeah, We're a DevTools like, company, and it, like, you have to go through all of this. Look at all this. You have to go through. It's a different path for Windows, Mac, Linux. It's really awful, but not anymore. If you're on Replit, you just fork the template and get going. You submit code on your first day instead of getting your dev environment working on your first day. And so we've also got a totally new flexible layout. So if I want my console to be up here, I just drag. It gives me some nice clues of where it's going to land. Nothing's too surprising. Ooh, really today. intuitive. <laughs> uh, I like to have Ghostwriter in a pretty prominent spot, so I can put it here. Um, our web page is really meant to be in full screen, so I can maximize it. Always looks better that way. And we can shrink back down. Ghostwriter is important enough that sometimes I like to just float it and keep it anywhere. And so no matter where I am, I can talk to Ghostwriter and get hints about how to code, especially because I'm not great at JavaScript. Now. We can also search over hundreds of thousands of files and millions of lines of code just as fast as you can locally. No compromises when you're in Replit. So make something great. Looks like the home page is defined here. Um, I want to be more current with the youth. So let's see what Ghostwriter would say is a new tagline we could do to impress Gen Z. All right, so we're here in the search. We change the thing okay. and it auto updates. Something to impress Gen Z. So we rebuilt our, ground, our Git support from the ground up. And you can see that it, it automatically syncs to all the changes that you're doing. Um, we rebuilt the service layer, more secure, faster. It'll respond instantly to your changes. And so you can see, even if you lose your Git changes, you're going to have Replit history backing you up. So if you accidentally destroy your unstaged changes, you don't have to panic anymore. You're not even at the mercy of your undo buffer. You can go back to any point in time because we're constantly saving and keeping your work safe. And so you can just go back, restore, and then commit it to Git. Now, something you can't do on your local environment is spin up whole brand new computers on demand. So now I'm in our Goval repo. This is our backend infrastructure. It's written in Go. It evaluates code. It's Goval. And even here, I have a brand new 16 CPU and 16 gigs of RAM, and I think I gave this one about 64 gigs of storage. Now, I also get to skip all that horrible onboarding, just like before. Um, it's even harder than Replit Web, honestly. And this computer's never even heard of node modules. It doesn't know what a TypeScript language server is or why people have to restart it all the time. And because I'm an old Vim user, as you heard me tell Luis, um, I can actually do the layout entirely from the keyboard. So you can fully drive from the keyboard. That's dropping later this week. We can set up however I want it. We can put a Git pane over on the side. And we can go back to some files I was working on. I was working on some deployment files. And so those are written in Go. You'll see me pop those up. And maybe it doesn't land in quite the place I want it. This is actually harder to fix in Vim when you wind up with a buffer in the wrong spot but you can just slide it over to the left, no problem. Now, in the first REPL, I was pairing with artificial intelligence, but you can see here 
as I navigate through with um, language servers. You don't need to search or use AI. You can use classic language servers too. I'm also pairing with human intelligence. If you know him, you might call him superhuman intelligence. It's Brad, our SRE, and you can see he's here in the REPL with me typing. Because we're in the cloud, we can share our environments. You can't just destroy and uh, create them on demand. You can also share them. And I'm going to chat with Brad because I've got a really great idea. We talked about that new server in Mumbai, but I also hear we have some users in Brazil and they'd like a new server too. So I tell Brad, hey, I think we should just turn up a server in Brazil. He's an SRE and he'll give me some good advice. Um, and Brad's typing. Hey, he says go for it, so I'm gonna try. I heard it was a hard project, but let's see if I can take a first pass really quick. I'll go to our all new code search. Um, again, it's moving really fast, just like in local development. Um, US Central One is in Iowa. Let's just go move those servers to Sao Paulo. How hard can it be? I'll just replace it. Um, that changed 60 odd files. I don't know, I, I think this is a pretty good change. Let's see what Brad thinks. Oh, it'll definitely take down prod. Okay, I probably shouldn't do this. Maybe I should revert. And actually I think uh, Brad might beat me to the punch and he reverts my change for me. We're working, we're collaborating in real time on the same branch. You don't just have to do Git workflows. You can do pair programming remotely. Um, Brad and I don't come to the office every day, so this is very handy. Um, and now, sort of one final surprise is that this whole time in the video, earlier when I was presenting, none of that was in a web browser. This is actually in the all new Replit desktop app. <laughs> so finally, you can put it in a prominent place on the dock where it belongs, and that'll be coming in the next couple of months. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you, Scott. The, the main message we're trying to get across uh, is um, like you can run a very complicated code base like Replit today and you can work on it in this very fun and interactive way with your teammates. Up next, we're gonna talk about extensions. Um, and uh, extensions are a, a new primitive on our platform. Basically, practically every editor has extensions, but we think that uh, the way we built extensions are extremely unique. Um, so first of all, the security model. Again, similar to deployments, uh, extensions uh, have actually, uh, we've innovated on the security model. Most IDE extensions, and I don't know if most people know this, the moment you install an extension, it actually has access to everything. It has access to your, I don't want to scare you, but don't install random VS Code uh, extensions. There's actually been incidents before where um, you know, an attacker might take over an extension and then start stealing people's code and secrets. This happened many, many times, and most IDE extensions are actually very insecure. And so we uh, leveraged uh, the uh, built-in uh, isolation of the web. So the web has really great isolation, and so we, we leveraged that to build a very strong uh, code isolation. We also have this permissions um, sort of model where every extension asks uh, for a certain set of permissions and the users, similar to iOS, the user can reject or accept that. Um, and then the cool thing about extensions is uh, very similar to building any app. So you, sh you saw Luis building an app. So if you want to build a Replit extensions, you also build, you can build it in the same way that you're building an app. And then uh, as you might have seen uh, on Replit now, we have a virtual economy. Um, bounties were uh, first, um, sort of entry into this idea of uh, facilitating um, commerce on Replit. So, so we think that one thing that's missing from a lot of developer platforms is the ability to facilitate commerce. So Bounties was actually us testing this idea of uh, being able to transact on the platform. Um, and now we're gonna add payments to literally every uh, place you're gonna be able to build on Replit. So we really care about our developers making money. We think there's a lot of incentive misalignment in the larger developer ecosystem because it's hard to make money. And so we wanna make everything that we build, you can make it free, but if you wanna make money, we'll also make that very easy to make money. Um, 
And of, of course, you could do all the different things, uh, you know, traditional editor, uh, editors allow you to extend. But the cool thing about Replit is that it's not just the editor. It's actually the computer behind it, the compute runtime. So you can, um, uh, you can change everything. You can add what we call Nix modules. I don't think we're talking about Nix modules today, but we're going to be uh, releasing them uh, soon. Basically, you can create these runtime packages to not only edit the editor, but also edit the underlying runtime. Um, and also, we're going to be adding a way for Ghostwriter to learn about your extension. So it'll be able to pull up documentation from your extension, and Ghostwriter will be able to use your extension as well in a similar way to ChatGPT plugins, which we think is a very innovative way to give AIs tools. Um, uh, extension developers will be able to expose an API for Ghostwriter to be able to use it on behalf of the user. Again, with a security-minded approach, where Ghostwriter is going to be able to ask the user if they're OK uh, for doing that. So I'm going to invite Faris, um, who runs our developer experience team, who's going um, to demo building an extension end-to-end. -to -end. Today, I'm going to replace a core part of Replit, which is a code editor, with another core editor. Uh, that other code editor is actually VS Code's code editor. Um, I wrote a blog post comparing the two. Um, I'm going to just use basic web technologies here, just an HTML file and a script file. Um, I'm going to call this VS Code. And the path is just index, so I'll just do slash. Um, I'm going to target all files, so that's my pattern. I don't have a logo, but I'll just do anything. OK, so let me actually try it out. So I'm going to load the extension locally. You can see here, I got it. I can open with VS Code. It's just showing hello world right now. Um, I'm going to move over to my script file, and I'm going to add the editor. Um, star. Is... So it's unlikely someone would need an editor, uh, a, a different <laughs> editor than the one we built for Replit. And a lot of people love VS Code, uh, and so uh, and so Ferris is just going to add support for VS Code yeah. inside Replit. Um, I like VS Code. It's good. And, um, and, and just to show you the power of extensions is that you can replace a core part of, of, of Replit with, with it. So we're excited yeah. about developers coming in and really building everything for Replit, including competing with their own product. All right. so, so, so we have an editor. I have an editor here. It's not hooked up. It's not using really any of the extension APIs. So let me just import that. Uh, as Replit from, oh my god. I'm not used to those key bindings. OK, so I have Replit here. I'm going to define the editor so I can use it later. I'm going to get the file path. So I opened index.html here. I want to grab that. Um, grab let me file path. And next up, I'm going to use the file watcher API. This actually gives you multiplayer for free. So if you want VS Code, but multiplayer, you can have it now. Uh, so ready, um, I get initial content here. So similar to this idea of bootstrapping we introduced earlier, this is also a, a bit of bootstrapping. You're actually editing the environment in the environment itself. So fans of small talk will be ecstatic about this. And initial content. Um, so if I reload here, I expect to see the context of contents of my HTML file. Okay, right, here we go. It works. Um, yeah, so can you, can you edit it? Mm. Yeah, let me actually open a uh, script uh, .ts. I'll close this. And it did not load the file. OK. Um, I can edit it, but I need to bind that. So let's go ahead and do that. I need to get the uh, get model. And I need to watch the changes. And here they give us changes. Then I'm going to write those changes. So, but I need to map them to the shape that we expect. So let's do that. Um, from C dot range offset to uh, C dot 
range offset plus the range length. And finally, insert the text. Um, so, okay, it reloaded before I wanted it to. All right, all right, cool. So I can edit it here. If and you see it you live, know, I can see it live. I can, you know, set the language here to TypeScript. Awesome. And if I reload now, I'll get syntax highlighting. In theory, yeah, there it is. Thank you. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so we have uh, extensions out in developer preview. Uh, any developer can go and build an extension. We have a few partners, some of them in the audience that are building extensions uh, for us, actually three of them in the audience, so that's really cool. Um, and it's still early. If you wanna uh, partner with us to, to build extensions for Replit, we're really trying to make it the most extensible computing platform in the world, so we're excited about that. Um, and then, you know, it wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't be a replica presentation without actually talking about AI. So, you know, when we uh, started Replit, um, we, uh, we took this very, uh, we took this, this uh, approach of trying to automate as much as possible. Um, Part of the reason why Replit has emerged as a, as a place where a lot of AI developers are, are building is because everything that we built uh, at Replit, uh, all the cloud services, all the automated ways of doing things like installing packages on your behalf, hosting servers on your behalf, uh, reconfiguring the editor based on uh, your code, all that stuff turned out to be extremely valuable um, for AI. So, all the automation we built for humans, uh, LLMs uh, are actually uh, getting a lot of benefit from today. And on top of that, we also built a Ghostwriter. Uh, you've seen a lot about Ghostwriter today. Um, you, you know that you know, Ghostwriter has this core uh, code assistance uh, experience. Um, we were one of the uh, uh, first startups to start building an open source models. We took this contrarian bet last year and said that open source and small models are actually gonna be as good as big industrial large language models. And uh, you know we have tons of Ghostwriter users right now. People really love it. They say they're a lot more productive with it. Um, and on top of that, a couple months ago, uh, we announced um, our AI pair programmer and um, which is the Ghostwriter chat. And Ghostwriter chat is um, it sort of functions more like um, functions more like a coworker. Uh, you can ask it questions. It can help you with brainstorming, like what Scott showed us, and um, and increasingly, it's it's actually able to use tools. So right now, it's pulling out uh, from documentation. In the future, the entire extensions API that Ferris showed you will be available for Ghostwriter. Again, uh, we want to make sure the security actually works out. We don't want a Ghostwriter to like lose your data or anything like that. So we need to figure out how Ghostwriter could, um, you know, we, we have the technology to, to, to have Ghostwriter edit your code directly, but we want to be very careful with that. Uh, and we think that's, uh, that's coming uh, over the next uh, weeks and months. And, you know, we put out this uh, vision um, last year. Before, you know, auto GPT went super viral, we talked about this idea of autonomous agent. We feel like, you know, code assistance in the sort of Ghostwriter copilot style um, was just the beginning. Then the pair programmer was this intermediate state. We think the ultimate state is an autonomous agent. They can actually ask it to do entire things on your behalf. So you can ask it to try and build a feature. It can go fork off a REPL and go try to build that feature. You can put it in a sandbox so that it's not doing anything crazy, it's not connected to the internet, and then go back to you and said, here's what I've uh, tried to do. You can review its work. Uh, we don't think these things will replace humans uh, and developers. We think that developers are more gonna be just augmented by the power of these autonomous agents. We think that developers will choose to use them for a lot of different tasks. And our goal is really making developers 10x, 100x more, more productive. Um, so that's, that's sort of where we're headed. And uh, finally, uh, speaking of 
code models. Today, we're announcing uh, a, new, um, a new code complete model. So in, in the editor, as you're typing code, when you're seeing these uh, suggestions, they need to be fast, but they also need to be high quality. And on Replit, uh, the quality was OK. Uh, it did its job, but we thought we could do a lot better. So you know, a, a, a few months ago, we started learning how to train uh, large language models. We actually never uh, trained uh, one before. We had done fine tuning, but we wanted to, we felt like we could do a good job at it, and so we wanted to, to, uh, to train a new model. And um, we were going kind of slow. We were very careful. We were training a lot of these 300 million parameter models. 10 days ago, I felt like it was important for us to have something to show today to you. So I went to our uh, small but mighty AI team, and I said, we need something by developer day. And they sort of uh, freaked out. Uh, we've never uh, you know, trained a you know, large run before. Um, but we decided to, to go for it. We call it the YOLO run. <laughs> and of course, uh, who do you call when you want to do a YOLO run? You call our friends at Mosaic. So we went to Naveen. I sent him an email. Hey, can you get on the phone? And he got on the phone the next 30 minutes. And we're like, hey, we need a lot of GPUs. We need to train this thing in the next few days. So they gave us 256 GPUs. And uh, we joined forces. And we, ran, we did this training run. And we finished it a couple days ago. And we didn't know what we were going to get. But here are, some, uh, here are some of the results. So we, we trained this uh, from scratch. This is the first uh, Llama style large language model for code. So what Llama showed the world, um, the Llama from, from Meta, the large language model, is that we've been severely under training our language models. For a long time, um, uh, we've been scaling up parameters and wasting a lot of money on, on compute and inference instead of training smaller models for longer. So uh, first of all, last year, this paper out of DeepMind called Chinchilla uh, said that you can train models longer. And we thought, OK, you know, we've got to train them now longer. Llama came and said, actually, you can train 10x that. And we are now uh, actually training more than Llama. So we're, we're training 20x uh, Chinchilla. So we trained a code model on 525 billion tokens of code. That's nearly most of the code in the world that is um, uh, permissibly uh, licensed. So you might have seen the news about Copilot emitting uh, GPL code. Um, we're not going to do that. And we also tried really hard to scrub any personal information from the training set. So we feel really uh, confident uh, that, um, that our, 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 our model is uh, standing on, on better uh, moral grounds. And um, we got 40% better performance than the best uh, open source code models. So this model is 2.7 billion parameters. It is very small. And it supports 20 languages. And it is, because it's small, it's very fast. Like It takes about 100 milliseconds to get uh, 25 tokens out of it. That means it's like 10x faster than some of the commercial code models out there. Um, and throughout training this, we used all of the new innovations in transformers, from flash attention to alibi embeddings. And we're really excited about this being the state of the art uh, code models. And so uh, to share some benchmarks, and again, this is very new. We ran these benchmarks last night. I'm going to invite uh, Michele up, who, uh, who led the uh, training on this, uh, on this project, to tell us a little bit about the uh, benchmarks. Let's use the last few minutes to talk about science today. Um, on this table, you will see results about uh, human eval. So human eval is a benchmark released by OpenAI a bit less than a couple of years ago. And it works in the following way. You pass na a natural language description of the code you want, and the model generates Python code. And then you execute it, and if the solution is correct, you, know, you get a plus one in your score. Um, as you can imagine, this use case is different compared to how we use Ghostwriter. We actually use it as a code completion model. But the truth is, we needed a way to evaluate if we were making progress during our training. So our very ambitious North Star was, we fixed the size of the model. We said it has to be 2.7b, otherwise the latency is going to be too high. And we want to just make it more powerful. And it turns out that we actually accomplished that, I would say, also 
we it was above. surprising because yeah. we actually didn't target this benchmark. Uh, a lot of the other models on the screen actually uh, really target this benchmark. You can see it in their, in their paper. Um, but for us, we're actually really focused on training a small infilling uh, enabled uh, model that could complete like single lines, maybe a couple of lines. But turns out we have something that actually can complete entire functions. And human eval also relies a lot on natural language. And we haven't been trained on a lot of natural language. So it was very surprising for us that we're actually doing better than, than the 16 billion parameter cogen model, right? So, uh, you know, a, a model that is uh, 5x bigger than us uh, and, and we're, we're, uh, we're sort of doing better no, like by, by a significant amount. And then uh, we finished another training run uh, uh, also. Literally two days ago. <laughs> two days ago. Yeah. And we used uh, Raplet data uh, to fine tune the model. And we got a 50% boost. So we went from 21% on eval to 30%. Uh, and now we, uh, this model beats the state of the art uh, 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 among the open source, open source code models. Right. In the next slide, we're going to talk about commercial models. Yeah, then you know, we were in bold and we figured out let's put Ghost Rider to test, uh, let's put our rapid code to test versus commercial or you know, closed source models. Um, so let's start from the bottom of this, of this table. So Lambda is a model released by uh, some of my collaborators at Google a couple of years ago. And it was the first paper that showed that by training on web data only, so Lambda is not trained on any code, you can actually do decently well on this kind of benchmarks. The reason being, as you can imagine, there is quite a lot of code around in the web, you know, stack overflow, geek for geeks, and so forth. So that sort of put a baseline in the human level performance. Um, you can see that we are by far the smallest model in that table, okay? So going all the way up, Llama, we pick the largest in the model family, the 65B, and you know, we are very close with our base model to Llama 65B. Codex is the initial model released in the OpenAI paper a bit less than a couple of years ago, a 12B specifically tuned just on Python, while our, our model is you know, working very well over 20 languages. We are, very, you know, we are even better than that with our fine-tuned model. Last but not least, I had to mention Palm Coder because I was one of the you know, key contributors on that side of the paper. It's a model 200 times larger than ours. Like exactly 200 times, which, yeah. is, a, which is kind <laughs> of a... 2.7 times 200, that's what you get. A bit of a coincidence, get. yeah. Yeah, and you know, we're, we're close enough with much better latency, of course. So, and, and by the way, we're not even trying here, and we're not like really bragging. <laughs> like if, if we trained on a little bit more natural language so we can understand the um, like human eval prompts better, I, I think we would, uh, we would totally. we'd probably exceed it. So speaking of natural language, during one of our you know, late night sessions prompting the model, you know, we had a new toy in our hands, so we started to play with it. We realized that it was doing remarkably well also in natural language prompts. So, you know, Amjad was having some you know, chatbots. Yeah, I, I started using it for like natural language, uh, um, just for fun, and I was blown away. There were some zero-shot prompts that it did better than the original GPT-3. It does better on a lot of uh, extraction and summarization than all the small GPT-3 uh, models like Ada and Curie and all these things. And so I asked Michele uh, and the Mosaic team, hey, like, I have this hunch that we actually are like, pretty good on like, non-coding tasks. And so we ran this and it literally finished last night. Yeah, so we, we picked four benchmarks which we can find also in the original Llama paper. So we picked their smallest one, the 7B, still more than two times larger than ours. And we also put it in comparison with Stable LM, the recent language model released by Stability literally like a few days ago. That one is a 3B, so comparable in size with ours, with the key difference that they're training on, if I recall correctly, 1.5 trillion tokens, most of them are text. So these models are expected to be much better than we are in this benchmark. So going left to right, these are all common sense benchmarks. Mainly it means we pass in the context a paragraph, a question, and a few multiple choices. And as you can see, we're very competitive on the very left one because this is a self-contained benchmark. It means all the information is in the prompt. Now if you go to the far right, you know, we end up to hard key which is a benchmark about basically, I think, grade three to nine science question that you will get at school. Of course, we're not training on Wikipedia, we're not training on any you know, common knowledge, we're just training on developer documentation and comments. So a lot of science is lacking in our model, but still, we can go through half of the questions pretty well. 
I think these results really emboldened us. Yeah. And you, know, you gave me the green light right. to announce this. <laughs> so we're already working on a 7B model. So we're going upscale more than twice the size. Uh, we're going to have a different data mixture. Uh, we're going to have a way more generic model that can deal with language, can deal well with code, and a lot of other goodies that are not allowed to yeah, be supposed to. Yeah, I mean, the, <laughs> it's, it's really hard to overstate this. It was very surprising. And, and you know, Michele is a, a PhD in AI, and it was very surprising for him. Um, it, like the, the far left side is like doesn't require any external knowledge, and that's why we're like close to Llama and beating uh, Stable LM. Uh, on the right, far right side, because a lot of it's require external knowledge, and the moment we augment this uh, uh, this model with external knowledge, it, it's going to do a lot better on this benchmark and other benchmarks. And so, I think it caused a huge update in our minds. We feel like we have the foundations of a generic foundation model. Um, and so, so we're gonna we're gonna scale up, and and um, and, and we think once we get to to seven B, perhaps perhaps more, it's gonna be a very competitive model. And uh, we're announcing today that we're open sourcing this model. So we're gonna open source this model uh, commercially. Yeah, uh, permissible license. You can build on it uh, commercially. You can uh, tune it. Do do do. We're very inspired by what's happening in Llama. It's kind of unfortunate that it's actually not a permissible license. And uh, we want to give back. You know, a lot of it is like trained on open source code. We've used CodeGen, and, and we think the right thing is to open source it. So we're open sourcing the base model, uh, the Replit uh, uh, Code V1 3B. Um, and um, it'll drop. Uh, literally, everything's happening in the last like few days. So we haven't even gotten a chance to put it on Hugging Face. So like, it's it'll coming. take us a few days to put it on like Hugging Face and GitHub. And, uh, probably like by early next week, we'll we'll have it uh, open sourced, and um, and and we we think uh, you can do a lot of things with it. Uh, we're excited to just see the community put it to test, uh, see what you can do with it, um, and 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 really hoping to start a conversation about small models and how can uh, we get the best out of small models because um, we think small models are uh, very important for a future of and. Um, open ecosystem around AI and large language models because they, they're easy to run, anyone can run them, anyone can hack them. And so that's, uh, uh, that's our big announcements. And thank you, Michele. Thank you. By the way, uh, <laughs> Michele, our, our AI team is very small. Like, uh, uh, like uh, I think uh, two people were like full time on this project. Uh, and so uh, if you want to join us, if you want to train models, um, and, and we have a lot of exciting things we haven't really gotten into. We want to build um, you know, action transformers, fine-tuned on our, on our data. We want to build, um, we're collaborating with, with Google on, on some big projects here as well. And, and so there's a lot of exciting AI uh, projects to do, but our, our team is very small. So uh, we really need uh, uh, talent here to, to be able to do more. So today we talked about a deployments, a way, the easiest way to get from an idea to a production app that you can scale. We talked about workspace and all the different ways you can scale up your working environment and be able to run any code base in the world. We talked about extensions. Um, we, we would love, we invite developers to come and make Raplet better and hopefully also make a living in the process. We talked about Ghostwriter throughout this presentation. So Ghostwriter is not just one thing. We don't see AI as a separate thing from Replit. We see AI really permeating every aspect of Replit. And we try to infuse it in everything that we do because we think it changes software in a fundamental way. So um, today, uh, you know, we, have a, we have a gift for you, everyone who tuned in and, and, and joined us live. If you go to replit.com, dev day, you'll see, you'll see our, our gift. And um, with that, we have a hackathon uh, here tonight. So folks who want to stick around and, and hack uh, would love to have you. Um, but, but thank you. Thank you so much. I know we, we've had like some rough edges, but hopefully we got the message across in this presentation. Thank you.